Um, I just want to wish everyone a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you may be joining us from. Um, I can see already in the chat that we've got people here from Nebraska, Texas, Canada, um, Carnegie Mellon, Taiwan. I'm glad to see that we're really spanning the full the full range of uh, of academics uh, across the globe, which is really what makes this quite special. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Avi Stamen, and I am the CEO of Academic Language Experts. And this is the latest installment in our publication success interview series. Um, we already have more than a year of interviews uh, behind us, for, so you're welcome to, if you want to take a look back at previous interviews that we've done, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, during these interviews, the common thread, the common theme between them is uh, I really have the opportunity and really the privilege of being able to engage in conversation with innovative thought leaders in academia and specifically uh, thought leaders in the field of academic publishing. Um, and my hope and goal and why I set out to do this was to strengthen the bridges between authors and publishers. Um, I think that authors, you know, are obviously, um, it, it, it's a tango, right? Authors uh, need publishers to publish their books and publishers are looking for good authors with fascinating and interesting uh, research, but there's not always an understanding between the two and, 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 and having these conversations really helps open those doors. Uh, today, I'm really, I'm honored and delighted to be joined by Christy Henry, and Christy is the director of Princeton University Press. Um, and her accolades go on and on. We've tried to, uh, to sort of, uh, uh, summarize them and, uh, quickly. Um, since her arrival in 2017, the press has opened a Beijing office and acquired a new building in Oxford. They've launched an audio imprint, Princeton Audio, an in-house speakers agency called PUP Speaks, um, which is a really cool initiative you should check up, uh, a digital marketing team, a creative media lab, an intellectual property team. They built a new website with an ideas blog and podcast. And uh, maybe most importantly, they were the first university press to commit to an ENI strategic initiative formed back in 2018. Uh, that initiative included uh, a wide range of, um, of things, including the creation and implementation of a code of conduct, raising early career salaries by over 20%, um, the creation of fully paid internships and PUP publishing fellows for underrepresented communities, global diversity grants for authors under contract, and supporting diverse voices grants for book proposal development. I urge you not to be shy throughout the entire conversation. If you have a question, if you have a comment, please chime in via the chat. Um, in general, we collect what we, uh, you know, as many questions as we can answer, we'll try to answer at, at the end without going too long. Um, and uh, the Q&A will be at the end, so be sure to check, to, to stick around in order to, 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 get, to get that. Um, if you have a more personal question or want to discuss your specific research, um, you're welcome to reach out uh, to myself privately. You have my email here on the back of the screen, um, and, we'll, and I'll try and get back to you in the coming days. Um, there'll also be an opportunity to reach out uh, to Christy as, um, as appropriate. Um, we are recording this interview and plan to send it to anyone who registered uh, after the event, so, and you're welcome to share it with anyone um, uh, free of charge. Before we begin, I just want to take one moment to share a word about the company I run, Academic Language Experts. Uh, we provide language and publication support services to researchers, scientists, and other professionals to help them produce publication-ready texts at the highest levels. So this includes um, editing services, uh, preparing, helping scholars prepare their book proposals for great publishers such as Princeton, um, and other services that you can check out on our website. Um, so if you are in need of such services, don't hesitate to be in touch. Um, we're grateful and proud to have helped scholars translate, edit, and prepare their research in over 50 different languages over the past year. Articles and books we worked on have been published with top academic publishers around the world, including, of course, Princeton. Um, it's our mission to help our authors achieve publication success and be a source of guidance and support throughout their journey. And now, with great ex excitement and no further ado, I want to introduce you to Christy. Christy, thank you so much for joining me today. It's, it's really an honor and pleasure of having you here. Alvi, the joy is mine. I want to thank you and Alana for all the amazing preparatory work and um, a special thanks to everybody. If, if I'm amazed and in awe from where you were chiming in, um, please contribute to the conversation. And also that you're all doing this in a moment of incredible global tragedy building upon several years of such uh, that you've managed to find some time and attention for this is uh, especially meaningful and, and I will endeavor to make it worth that time and attention uh, to the best of my abilities. Indeed, we were, we were just commenting before we got started here about the fact that, you know, with all the Zoom fatigue and the fact that we're sort of sick, sick of our, most of us are sick of our screens, um, you know, and especially with what's going on uh, in the Ukraine, 
um, you know, to be able, for, first of all, I hope this is a little bit of a, of a place where you can forget about, um, you know, what's going on outside, um, but we really appreciate you joining us today and, and participating in this conversation. So, so let's, so let's, let's get, let's get right into it. Um, tell us about your journey. My guess is that it's not a typical one to becoming the director of Princeton University Press. That's not something that happens overnight. From what I understand, you set some precedents that uh, maybe, maybe hadn't been done before. So maybe tell us a little bit about the lead up to that and how that, how that came about. Sure. I, I am a, a long life, um, long haul university press publisher, proud one, uh, very much motivated by the mission of university press publishing. I started as a freelance copywriter um, a geologic era ago for the University of Chicago Press and then moved into an editorial assistant position and have had the opportunity just to learn across all different experiences that the university press world has to offer. Many years spent acquiring science books. And so if I dip into some science speak, um, this is why. Uh, and I also spent later years at the University of Chicago Press really enjoying the time mentoring um, staff and managing people. The people part has been really just foundational to me. And then in 2017, I had the amazing opportunity to join this team at Princeton University Press, um, particularly appealing for its global commitment, for its mission, and um, yes, have, was the first woman to um, take the leadership role at PUP, and that'll, that we'll come back to that in terms of inclusion and publishing, um, but yes, it's, it's been a, a joy since. Amazing, and was there, can you tell us, can you think back to any moments or any events that occurred maybe as you were climbing the ranks to, to, to get to where you are today, that sort of opened your mind or, you know, towards or, or showed you maybe, you know, something that, that's, that you said, you know what, um, inclusivity is going to be an important part of my mission. Because as you said, um, Princeton was the first press to kind of make, put this front and center. Um, you know, I guess, I guess in 2022, maybe it's there, there. I imagine that many publishers have followed suit. I hope so, at least. Um, but what was it that kind of made you start thinking about these issues, maybe in a more serious way and also a more pragmatic way than, than, than I've seen with other publishers? Right. I think in, in terms of the moment, I mean, I, I, I wish I could say differently, but I feel like it's been a career time of moments of realizing more about the inequities uh, and that you know started early, having to work multiple jobs as an editorial assistant to endure the cost of living in Chicago, recognizing that those salaries were not meant to support people who didn't have other means. And I was not one of those people who had other means. Um, talking with colleagues over the years um, and, and a lot of mentoring of colleagues who were really struggling. They were women, they were, um, they were black, indigenous and people of color who were the only people in the conversation, the only people at, the only person at a table and how difficult that was. Um, trying to find as an acquiring editor, trying to persuade women and people of color to write books in the sciences and, and realizing what inequities there were. Um, I, so I think it's, uh, my, my point is more, it's been a kind of accumulation of experiences and observations and what I was sort of bearing witness to, um, the fact that it was only 2017 to be able to say that there was a demographic shift at one of the leading global university presses. That's too late. Um, so I, I knew that there was an opportunity to change. I, I listened to a lot of my colleagues who were also interested in change. And one of the um, commitments we make at Princeton is to use the resources that we have to really do good in the community and that being the global community. And, and that was the impetus for the uh, basically presenting our board of trustees with an equity and inclusion initiative that wasn't just words, but it was resources to support actions. And I think that's the most important part. We, many of us in our sort of hearts and minds and souls are committed to the equity, but we need the resources to be able to affect change and to affect change faster than it's happening in any organic way. Got it. So, so let's, so I want to, I want to follow that, you know, sort of line of reasoning. When you, when you, went to make that pitch to the to the board um or 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 now you know hopefully some of those things have actually come to fruition what was it that you were actually asking for it's very nice to say okay we want to become more inclusive but that actually has to we have to translate that into action so what were some of those action items that you said okay here are some of the things that i actually want to roll out and do first of all what does it mean to be an inclusive publisher and what are some of those practical things that you do to make that happen right so i it's probably more 
it's probably better to ask what I didn't ask for. I asked for a lot. Um, <laughs> they, uh, and, and we had, um, we, we've from the start taken a really sort of pluralistic approach because I think one can't change the publishing without changing the team. And so we had to, we had to acknowledge and reckon with who we were as publishers, um, which meant looking at the composition of our leadership team relative to the demographics of the staff and making sure that those were not out of alignment. We had to look at the demographics of the staff and, and reckon with um, how much over-representation there was. Like much of publishing, there have been a lot of studies of the whole of publishing, not just scholarly publishing, um, about the whiteness of the industry. Uh, and we had to acknowledge that where we were contributing to those trends. But then also really importantly, look at who we were publishing and more importantly, who we hadn't been publishing. So we, we used data, we studied our list and our pipeline. Um, at that time, we had only gender data on authors, but had also feedback from people like booksellers who would test our catalogs and say, how many pages in before I see a book by a woman? How many pages in before I see a book by a person of color? Um, how many pages in before I see a book by somebody from the global south? Um, and, and those were all sort of inputs that we were trying to respond to with the board. So we asked both to change who we were as publishers and um, who we publish and then how we publish, which meant a number of initiatives um, from converting all of our internships to paid internships, raising entry level salaries, rebalancing the leadership team uh, initially, at least on gender demographics, and we're working to expand more into race, race and ethnicity as we expand our own uh, team. On the publishing front, we really wanted to see ourselves as being able to intervene faster than the academy was going to change. As a scholarly university press, a lot of our own, uh, a lot of who we are in the world is defined by these really synergistic relationships with universities. Um, for better and sometimes for challenge because it it's a conservative environment, very progressive in thinking, but conservative in action, I think would be my observation. So we wanted to think about how are we positioned as a publisher to intervene and disrupt some of those norms in perhaps a faster way. So we've looked all across the life cycle of publishing to think about where we can make those interventions. Um, some of them were very early, so what a really exciting uh, program for us is the Supporting Diverse Voices grants. And I know later in the spring, Avi, you'll be talking with Laura Portwood Stacer, who is one of our partners on these grants. We realized at the earliest stages of the life cycle of book writing, historically excluded authors don't have access to editors and they don't have a necessarily a lineage of mentorship where their advisors are going to be talking to them about how to create a book proposal, how to approach a press. So we have partnered with five coaching partners who are working with ideas and helping authors generate proposals that can then be considered for publication. Um, the uh, humanities application cycle actually closes in, uh, let's say, two hours and 15 minutes. It's, um, it's the third cycle. Our first cycle uh, was for women and transgendered authors and scholars and journalists in the sciences and mathematics. The second cycle was for BIPOC scholars in the social sciences, and now we are um, BIPOC scholars in the humanities. And each of those is sort of 15 new projects working with book coaches that will then generate proposals. And one of the things that we also are really excited about this, those proposals won't all be published by Princeton University Press. We're trying to think about ways we can make an impact far beyond our own walls and our own offices. These proposals can be published by any university press. We ask for a first option on them, but we're really trying to, we're trying to break networks. We're trying to disrupt. I think in a lot of the work on inclusion, you have to break in order to rebuild. And this is one of the ways that we're seeing that. Um, Global equity grants are another. We um, we realized that there were disparities about how um, how authors who were under contract at, at Princeton could actually spend time working on their manuscripts. And because of inequities within the academy, sometimes about funding or um, career and family, that there were patterns that we observed into how quickly manuscripts would be developed by uh, certain over overpublished sectors of our author list. And the global equity grants give authors who are underrepresented on our list, and authors make that determination as to whether they're up or underrepresented, the chance to apply for a grant up 
to $7,500 to be used on anything. We have a series of categories that we put out there. It might be travel, though that's been sort of moot for two years. Um, in these last two years, uh, really noticeable trends there in that 90% of the grants we've awarded have been to cover childcare costs. And we've had authors write in saying that means, you know, they've been able to finish their manuscript three years earlier than they would have given the circumstances. Um, so again, they weren't getting the support from their institutions we're finding ways to, to disrupt that. I also wanna make sure and, and throughout today to not speak just about Princeton, but to really talk about how broadly this is a commitment of the university press community. And I think publishers more um, beyond university press publishing. Um, we are part of a consortium with the American Political Science Association, um, minority serving institution book workshop. Um, it's a group that has a number of university presses and APSA. And it was a recognition that book workshops tended to take place in elite institutions only. And this group is getting together to fund workshops at minority serving institutions exclusively. So another really important way to kind of shift norms and shift, uh, even shift intellectual lineages and the access they have. Um, University of California Press has a next gen initiative, which they've launched, which is terrific. Um, MIT Press has a supporting diverse voices grant as well that they just launched this year. So we're starting to see more and more of this across the community, very necessary change. It's really, it, what, what amazes me is that, you know, if we, if we think about um, a book that like, and, and the continuum of, of, of a scholar's research, right? So they're starting to write their, they're, they're, they're doing their study and then they're writing their research and then maybe they need help with, you know, editing or revisions and then they get to the book publisher, right? That's sort of like the, the what I would say is the classic or typical approach. And, and, and in a certain way, and I, I think I've maybe sort of, um, you know, digested this um, subconsciously from some publishers. It's like, it's a very passive role. A publisher is very, you know, sort of wait and see who comes to you. And I think it would have been easy to kind of put your hands up and say, well, you know, these are, we're choosing from what we get. It's not our problem to say, you know, who we get. It's up to the, the authors to write. What I, what I, what's really, I, I guess, hitting me now is, is how much you said, we're not going to kind of use that as an excuse to say, well, what we have is what we have, but actually say, let's recognize the fact that we can disrupt the chain that comes well before maybe even our, our, our own, you know, typical work and think about how do we develop a new pipeline of projects that is just different than would have been otherwise. And not just, you know, with individual scholars, but actually like developing this whole new channel. Um, so I don't know if there's a question there. I just think it's, it's, it's so, I, I I think there, I think there's like a certain, you know, really intuitive um, brilliance there. So yeah, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Avi. And, and it is, it's really, it's about being proactive. Uh, right. and, and I think that that's, I think we're, we're aware at the rate of change just happening organically, even if you're just to watch the sort of demographic statistics within disciplines across the world, if we were to wait for those to become equitable, it, it will be, 10 university press leaders from where I am, you know, it'll be a, a century from now. And, and I don't think we can afford to wait. And, and thankfully I have a whole team of people that doesn't think we can afford to wait. Now, I, I do want to, I do want to push back a little bit and say that I, I appreciate the fact that you not only is Princeton doing good work, but other um, university presses are doing good work. Um, I'm just going to push back and say that even in preparation for this um, chat that we're having, um, we both tried to find, you know, uh, tried to be, you know, include, um, you know, an individual of color to, 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 to join us. And it is hard to find acquisitions editors um, from underrepresented populations. There are plenty of women, um, but other underrepresented populations, um, I, I, was, I was disappointed. And this is just by going through LinkedIn, you know, and, and doing a search for acquisitions editors. This isn't necessarily a um, condemnation of any particular publisher per se. But I'm curious to hear sort of your reaction to that. And also, what, what do you think, you know, I, I'm sure we haven't solved all of the world's problems. What do you think are some of the major issues that maybe still uh, exist and that need to be, that more needs to be done about? Right, right. Um, it, it's dismaying, Avi. I mean, and, and, um, and, and I think puts the university press world and the publishing world at large at a real disadvantage for being able to say that we are mission-driven, committed to the very best scholarship, that best, 
very best scholarship is not only happening um, among limited demographics, it's happening everywhere. And you need acquisitions editors who are um, who can bring their own life experiences into this space and be able to create those relationships with prospective authors. Um, we are, um, the university press community is well aware of that, struggling still with leadership to put people in positions, really working to build um, more opportunities for mentorship and I think more importantly sponsorship. So sponsorship really trying to find ways to give opportunities to historically excluded of which there are many and particularly people of color. Uh, I think there are, are things like the Mellon Diversity Fellowships that have been quite successful in seeding acquisitions departments across the university press community. At PUP, another part of the um, strategic initiative that we launched was to have our PUP Publishing Fellows where we're um, basically the board approved uh, 10 fellows over the course of five years who will essentially get training at the press and they are uh, from historically excluded um, populations and excluded according to all statistics from publishing. So again, almost there, there are huge portions of people excluded from this community. Um, and, and we're hoping that that will start to affect the change. 10 is, is small. We need all of us to be thinking far more than 10. It needs to be 10 exponentially increased, but I think most importantly, we have to be persistent and make sure that both we're, we're training and giving people opportunities, but as we know from so much of the literature and the, and the lived experiences, that it's the spirit of belonging that is what really needs to be felt. So there are some really harrowing accounts uh, in places that have been published, like the Scholarly Kitchen, about what people of color have experienced, um, direct quotes and, and microaggressions. Um, and so I think we, we simultaneously have been undergoing a lot of education ourselves decentering white supremacy, training in anti-racism. There's a wonderful coalition for diversity in scholarly communication, C4DISC, um, that is working across scholarly communications organizations. And um, we, Princeton is a member of that. I've been one of the writing members of that. There are two toolkits now published that I recommend to many. Um, one is the most recent one was an anti-racism toolkits for organization that essentially gives a blueprint for how to shift the organization because I think that's where um, we can't just create the opportunities, we have to create the reason and inspiration for um, continuing careers in publishing. We, we want the people to have spent the sort of 30 years that I have in it and to find that it is a space um, uh, of belonging and of impact. Right, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, I... I want to, I'm curious if you could talk, uh, sort of like bring us back to the beginning of our conversation a little bit and talk about sort of traditionally my, my hunch, and I could be wrong about this, my hunch is that aside from the populations themselves, the authors that were represented um, by some of the major publishers generally stem from, uh, you know, a certain subsection of the university, of the, of the academy, um, you know, it makes sense. It's very natural that, you know, let's say Princeton, um, uh, you know, scholars would want to publish in Princeton University Press or another, you know, um, large presses. And, 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 and clearly those individuals are, 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 you know, worthy and talented of being there. But I was hoping that you could speak a little bit about sort of maybe what was historically in terms of, you know, the types of authors um, that were published um, in terms of their university affiliations. Um, and that has, has that changed as well? Meaning, you know, if I'm a, if I'm teaching at, you know, a community college or, but I have, you know, or I'm teaching at a, you know, college that maybe doesn't have the same, you know, national prestige, but I'm doing important, you know, ear to the ground, uh, uh, innovative research, um, is that, you know, do I have more of a shot now than I may have had 20 years ago? Uh, emphatically, yes. And I think that that just shows, um, again, a shift in perspective. Here, here you're talking about elitism, right? I mean, essentially, inclusion needs to be also operating in an anti-elitist state. Um, it doesn't mean that those elite institutions don't still have great resources, uh, and they do, and there's a, there's a disparity of resource allocation, too. Um, we have resources as a university press that, that our peer university presses don't have in the form of an endowment. 
the question is what we do with them. And so we want to use those resources to affect and promote change. That includes really recognizing that excellent original scholarship exists everywhere. Uh, it may be more publicly known from certain institutions because they have, you know, media machines and other access. Um, it might be because those scholars have the ability to travel to conferences the world over because they've got resources. Um, the pandemic has given us phenomenal opportunities to gather by Zoom as we're demonstrating today and, um, and really um, reduce some of those barriers of exposure of networks. It all, it very much is it's a people-driven endeavor, both the academy and scholarly publishing. And so when you limit the people who get to be known and seen and heard and limit the people who get to be together, of course, it's going to have a very reductive impact on the publishing. We're in a, a, a space that has really changed those limits in, I think, formative ways. And I, I do believe it's incumbent upon all of us to pull through those very positives. So absolutely thinking about thinking about the work itself, what we're looking for is excellent, exciting work. That doesn't come with any assumption that that work is better at an Ivy League institution than it is at a community college. We just have to be able to find that work, to see it, to help transform it into book manuscripts. And so, yes, I think um, similarly, we've had, there had been sort of trends in university press publishing of only having tenured faculty write books, for example, or having the peer review process be administered by tenured faculty. That you can also imagine really limits and limits the conversations and limits the sharing of expertise. So those are other areas where we've really shifted. We are not, we, we are not using just professors to review manuscripts uh, and proposals. And that has a formative change. It just, it's, a, it's an opening up. It's again, it's kind of having to, to break and rebuild and reimagine. Um, that, that I think I think is happening. We're also doing things, um, one of actually our, our first year publishing fellows is working on a community reads, a first year reading program for community colleges explicitly. And that is one of the projects that he is, he's leading himself, researching it and carrying it through this year. So realizing that we also have to engage more actively in conversations with these other institutions, it can't be done on just a book to book, author to author basis. It needs to be more expansive. Um, and again, that's something we're trying to figure out how best to do. Okay. And, and in terms of, um, I mean, you could, I, I know you mentioned a lot of initiatives and I'm not sure you're gonna be able to give specific information on, on each one, but maybe let's just take the publishing fellowships um, where is it that, 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 you know, uh, those in the audience today can get more information about that fellowship and what are some of the basic criteria for applying just to, you know, so that the, those who are watching can get a better sense and idea of whether it's relevant to them or maybe it's, you know, for a different group of scholars. Right. Um, so, uh, the, the, the PUP fellowships can all be found on our website and I will tuck the website in there. And there is a section, um, one of the other things we did was basically under the about Princeton, you will see next to our mission, vision and values is equity and inclusion. So we've again, made sure to amplify the work and make it visible and transparent. And within that, you can find all of the nested programs that we're involved with and the direct grants that we're offering. Um, another resource, which we'll show later is, uh, or I could put it here, but it's um, in the humanities commons is Ask Up, which is about um, university presses responding to questions. And this, the, these responses are um, handled by different university presses on a rolling basis. So a lot of the other grant information appears there too. And with, I wanna make sure everybody has that as a resource. Um, the, the publishing fellows, um, the, we basically, those run once a year, the applications open in January. And so the, the application period for next year is closed. The, the uh, fellowships run on a fiscal, academic fiscal year basis. So they start July 1. Uh, so it would be, if you were looking for the following year, um, it would be visiting our website in January of 23 um, to, for uh, fellowships that will be offered in March. We will extend the offers for that year. Uh, the one we and a different group 
will be deciding every year this we we're quite excited that our first year fellows are now on the selection committee for second year so that's another way we kind of embed the new learning and new experience we did in the second year decide that um that we would exclude advanced degrees because we really wanted this to be an opportunity a really first step opportunity for applicants we may not decide that again for next year we've talked about other things like doing a um, a career change focus for a year so take people who are at a at a career mid-career someplace and keen for a change and thinking about that as a focus for the fellows for a year uh, again just to, to come at this with broad thinking about um, equity and inclusion um, so that um, that's just a, a one fellowship. The um, Mellon fellowships have not announced the next round yet, but that would be another thing to look out for in the university press landscape. Those are focused, they have been focused on acquisitions, editing roles at a number of host presses. And so uh, again, hopefully another round of funding will be announced. Um, I don't have any information on that now. I wanted to just pick up, I, if, I, I know we'll have a chance to do questions and answers. Um, and I, there's a lot going in the chat. And thank you so much for, for keeping these ideas coming. I wanted to touch on something that um, that Joanna Kafarowski asked about the pushback from traditional mainstream, what we might consider um, happily over published demographics on our list. We're really trying to get at this with um, not taking a path to inclusion that involves exclusion. And what I've done is really reach out to these, these long-term PUP authors and series editors and share the data and say, look, I mean, this is this is what the kind of publishing we've done has led to. Um, when an author sees that that means that, uh, a, you know, single digit percentiles of women in a certain field, even those historically overpublished recognize what we're trying to do. And they recognize because they want this press to remain resilient and relevant. And we can't do it without this change. We can't continue on this trajectory and assume that we would still be a, a pioneer and a leader in this space within a few years. So I've taken the approach of really seeking the partnerships, making the case very transparent and knowable, um, not saying we're gonna cease publishing in an area, but really imploring for help in breaking networks, in referring, right? Making sure that everybody is thinking expansively about who they're giving guidance to, who they're sponsoring, who they're mentoring. Um, so, so far, um, not pushback. Uh, that's not to say it won't happen and, and we'll be braced for it when it does. We, we, we firmly believe this, and I firmly believe if my role is to ensure, and it is, the, the well-being of this press, then these are changes we have to undertake. Yeah, no, that's that's really. I, I I think that it's it's a really important point that you make that you know to kind of go beyond the mudslinging and try to get to real you know to real data um, that that sort of demonstrates some of the important trends. I think is really critical because it's sort of you know that's that's the language that we scientists speak, right? Um, and and therefore that's you know we have to figure out in every community. It might not be relevant for every community, but definitely in the community of scholars to be able to present things in a clear way I think is really important. So I want to kind of, you know, continue or, 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 or see how do we, how do you at Princeton and, you know, as part of the university press community, and by the way, uh, in parentheses, SQP is a fantastic resource. Um, I, I, I use it all the time and uh, interviewed Catherine Cox for Michigan State University oh. Press last week. So I'm a big fan. So I definitely <laughs> encourage everyone to, um, to check yeah. it out. Um, especially if you have questions about the publication process. Unfortunately, we can't get into like the nitty gritty of, of the publication process, but there's a lot of good materials there. Yes. Um, but I'm curious in the business world, right, we talk about KPIs, right? What are going to be your key performance in indicators? Or if I translate that into normal speech, <laughs> how do we, how, how are you going to judge whether you've made progress on some of these issues. Um, it, you know, the, 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 the need is clear, the, you know, the, you've gotten funding, that's all wonderful and great, right? But how are you gonna kind of measure yourself up against your, your initial goals? And I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, this year, but, um, you know, when you're thinking in like a sort of more broader sense, um, what do you would be success? Um, it, it, you know, when, when it's time for Christy to, to hang up her boots and, 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 and call it a day, you know, what are you going to be hopefully looking back at and, and, and be proud of? 
I'm, I'm glad you've asked. I mean, one of the things that I, I constitutionally love about the university press world is that we are mission driven, which means we measure by impact, right? So they're different, but we also do, we, we're, we're running a responsible business. And so there are, there are KPIs, there, there are returns. Um, it, it will vary by initiative. So, I mean, with the fellows, for example, one way we'll measure success is if those fellows continue on in publishing, will they after a year be um, both feel they are ready to enter the next chapter of a publishing career? Will they want to? Like, will we have persuaded them that there is enough of a culture of belonging out there in the university press world for them to contribute to and to feel that they can thrive. So that's, that's a, again, a, a data point of 10, but a really meaningful one because we will have spent a year with each of these individuals trying to build networks for them and make sure that they see this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an exciting and viable path for them. With, um, with the shift in authors, uh, we, we also are part of an AU Press's pilot program that is expanding the data and demographics collection to race and ethnicity. So it, really important that, you know, initially what we had was access to gender. We did shift, thankfully, to not be just a sort of binary gender, um, but, but that we know is just one axis of, of inclusion. We've worked diligently to change that, but we need, we need to make visible the race and ethnicity and also global. I, I'd mentioned this sort of focus on the global north. We're, we're factoring in geographic location. What we haven't gotten at fully yet is socioeconomic, and that's also critically important in coming back to that elitist element. And we're, so we're building up with each year, building up the data we're gathering so we can make these trends more visible. Um, what I'll be looking for, Avi, is, is change in the statistics. So after two years of, of efforts on gender front, we increased gender um, representation by women on the, the list on an average uh, by uh, five percentile points. That's small, but it's something, it's meaningful change. I'll be looking for the same in all these categories on our list. But another way that we measure our impact and, and the success of our efforts in publishing is, is are we attracting more BIPOC authors to the press? When we have the opportunity to have these, um, the, the Supporting Diverse Voices grants, will that then open up conversations with new cohorts of scholars who will think about Princeton, who might have never thought to submit to the press before, either because, as we were talking about, they, they are based at a school, a community college, College, or because they've looked in the front of our catalog for years and seen um, white European male and didn't see a place for themselves on that. If we start to increase the submissions from a wider group of individuals, that's another critically important measure of the impact of where we've invested. Um, and and the, our, our, the sort of the, our ability to adhere to our mission and our vision and values will be that much stronger. Um, and, and those are all dynamic. They have to be, the world is dynamic around us. Um, you know, that, that we've put equity and inclusion and belonging into our mission because it's necessary to call that out. Uh, you know, the long-term success of this is that we won't need any and I counsel in a committee because it will be so forebrained in everything we do. I don't envision that happening right we, we need to be tenacious and persistent uh and and meet words with actions for years ahead i don't imagine that changing anytime soon but that as if you talk about the very long long term horizons that will be it this will be just so much in our dna um it'll be as much as our in our dna as peer review is right like there isn't a university press that exists without peer review i want inclusion and belonging to be as embedded as peer review Okay, so I want to, if, if we're going to be talking, if we'll talk about peer review, um, I want to talk about a subject that's close to my heart um, and uh, something that I actually, I actually um, published an article in, I'm uh, sorry for the shameless self-promotion here, but yeah. I, I recently published an op-ed in Times Higher Education um, on how we can do a better job uh, dealing with linguistic discrimination. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, there, this is a... A complex subject which has within it a lot of different uh, factors, and we don't necessarily have time to delve into them all. Um, but on a very basic, superficial level, um, you know, giving scholars for whom English is not their native language, which oftentimes means scholars who are not from, you know, Anglo uh, centered uh, countries um, and often include underrepresented populations, 
um, giving them the access and ability to publish at the same level. And sometimes they really feel, you know, face an uphill battle because in addition to having to have, you know, all the qualities of, of good research, innovative and, 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 you know, groundbreaking research, they also need to contend with, with, with writing in a language, which is sometimes their second or even third language. Um, and I'm curious kind of to hear your thoughts um, about, about, you know, language issues and support, you know, um, I, you know, I think there's definitely room for, you know, on the, on, I think there's a tension, um, part of the inbuilt tension here is that, you know, on the one hand, I think we all value clear and, and, and coherent writing, right? Meaning it, it, it's very hard to accept a proposal, which is, you know, uh, is hard to understand. Um, right. On the flip side, um, there could be, you know, the, 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 we don't want to confuse clear writing with, with native English um, or standard English, um, as it may be. So I'm just kind of curious if that issue has come up at all in discussion among your team, and if so, kind of, do you have an approach to it? And and I'll I'll, I'll throw my um, my op-ed into the uh, into the chat here in case anyone's interested in reading. I do think you need to be uh, to 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 put in your your info, but I'll, I'll see if I can get it. Maybe Alana can get a PDF and put it there as well, so everyone can read it easily. Right, and Avi, I'm so glad you've raised that because you, you you had posed that as a as a topic point, and it it got me thinking a lot about university presses take so much pride in being a, the home of translations, right? And as part of our mission, this um, this commitment to the global exchange of writing and knowledge, and translations have funding and considerable amounts of grants. Um, we we have a, an endowment for translations, but not in those cases where it's um, it's English not as a lit native language, right? You're, you're talking about a different um, different type of work. And it's gotten me to think more about like, we should be thinking about that in addition to the way we support translations uh, and, and invest in translations. As you say- It's I mean, not just, by the, just to clarify, sorry to cut you off. It's not just about translation. It's also scholars who are writing in English and, 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 and have that capability, but to help them along, you know, with the editing process and the revisions process. Right. Yeah. But that's, I was saying that in a way that it seems, it seems unfair that we've supported translation so extensively, yeah. but not this, right, which is another, which is, is, is an impact of it, language exchange, um, and definitely impacts how a work is read and received. As you say, the, the writing, the writing is essential. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the um, Supporting Diverse Voices grants is that that's part of what can be worked on with a, a a book coach and a writing coach in terms of formulating a proposal that really conveys to those for whom English is not the first language, the native language, um, it can help bring those proposals to a more equitable state with those who have English as their primary language. So um, I, I intend to think more about about this, it, I, I have recommended over the years, I mean, there's, I think, really critical roles to be had in writing cohorts and cohorts that are across language and where peer-to-peer -peer help and learning can be profoundly impactful on projects. And again, I think the opening up of Zoom channels has facilitated that more. And I think that, that there's a way that that can be recreated for writing samples too. Uh, I think it, um, I, it's, it wouldn't be fair for me to say that doesn't impact how something is received because it, the press then needs to think about how to invest further to both make sure that, that, um, that peer reviewers find a way to assess it fairly and then also that it would travel through the life cycle of the book with the kind of support it needs. And that's more than just a standard copy editing. So part of it is just raising awareness and then raising resources to match that awareness to turn it into action. So you, you, you're you posing this has really gotten me to think about how can we support this in a meaningful way? And again, build out a lot of what we've been seeing and learning through the recent grant programs too. Yeah, I think like two very basic fundamental points, which have come up actually recently in an event we did um, with uh, two scholars of, of linguistic discrimination. I believe that was um, our event last month, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there were two really interesting things that kind of came out of that discussion, um, which, you know, maybe just food for thought. Um, uh, number one is um, to not assume because I think there's a sort of subconscious assumption um, that if the English is not perfect, then the writing is not good. And th those two things are different and separate. And it's important for us to separate those out. There are brilliant writers 
um, who, you know, their writing is poetry. And, and we actually, I have to say, just have take such a pleasure in translating them because it's, you know, it, 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 you really appreciate the beauty of the original. Um, or even English, which is not, you know, which has, you know, grammar or, or, or syntax issues, but you can tell the writing has a certain uh, music to it. Um, and, and, and trying to not just, you know, I think we all just sort of, as soon as we see a grammar error, we sort of like have a sense, oh, you know, okay, maybe there are, there are more fundamental issues. So that's number one. Um, and number two is, is, is being reflective and self-conscious enough to realize that, like, there is no real such thing as correct and incorrect English in the sense that, you know, um, the way that, you know, Brits use English, the way that, you know, English is used in India, the way that English is used maybe in Princeton, they're all different, they're all legitimate. And even if there are people who are making mistakes, it's where it's important that we don't, you know, we're not the arbiters or the, the gatekeepers of what is, you know, uh, good English and not. And actually, if we, if we try to keep a little bit of an open mind, sometimes there are writers that, that take a bit of a different approach or style or, and, and that can be enriching if we're willing to take it in. Um, if we see our role as to, you know, kind of make sure that it all sounds monolithic, then, then I think we're actually doing a disservice. So, and that, but that sort of is counterintuitive sometimes to edit, especially editors, right? We're used to like, I, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that, those are some of the. No, and, 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 and absolutely. I mean, we have to see ourselves as being in support of whatever that work is trying to convey and not reducing it to a singular archetype of the English language. You're, you're so right. And there've been some great articles and reflective pieces on editorial experiences where um, where editors have tried to kind of, you know, perhaps render something in uh, conventional style guides, whether it's Chicago Manual of Style or others, and really taken away the meaning of a work. This has also motivated a lot of the shift in publishing houses to make sure that on our uh, manuscript editing staffs, there, uh, staffs, there are, um, there are BIPOC editors, which is also another area where there are, um, there are not huge populations to be found, but there, there are some terrifically skilled editors and increasingly authors are asking for those pairings, which we then need to provide to support. It's an area of, of great learning for us and necessary learning for us and, and another area of change. So our um, production editorial department has actually had that as part of their initiative over the last two years to expand and, and also um, think about where we can train more purposefully uh, manuscript editors, because I think that's where you get the versatility of ear, right? We don't want to say that there is a, in terms of inclusion, we don't want to say that there is a dominant English. We see it as a press with a, an Oxford office and a U.S. office, uh, and we don't, um, we don't Americanize the books that originate in the UK. Yeah, great point. Fantastic. Excellent. All right. Um, I, we, we could probably continue this conversation for, for a few hours, but I, I want to, it's important for me to, that we get to some of the questions that were raised here. I think some really great questions. Um, but before we do so, uh, just two uh, quick programming notes. Uh, so uh, Alana's going to put up on the screen and, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Alana. I don't know if everyone always has the opportunity to know behind the scenes, but she really works hard to make sure these events um, turn out uh, brilliantly and, 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 and without any hitches every time. So, so thank you, Alana. Um, My pleasure. All right, fantastic. So she's going to uh, put up on the screen uh, our upcoming events um, uh, so that if you are curious, you know, about um, other really fascinating conversations, including with Laura, uh, Christie's colleague, who is a dynamo, if I may say so myself, um, uh, we'll, we'll have that up uh, uh, for you shortly. Um, so you can kind of take a look and here we go. Yes. So the next, the next upcoming event is, uh, is a month from, is about a month from today. Uh, and, uh, Laura will be discussing how to craft a winning book proposal. So this is a good continuation of the conversation with Christy. If you are inspired to, uh, to consider submitting to, uh, to, to Princeton or to any other university press, she's really going to break down sort of the, the, the key tips and tools for, for doing that. Um, she's also a two-time Jeopardy winner. So, um, <laughs> Kudos to her. That's very cool. Um, hopefully we'll have some time. What did you say? I was going to say, save up all your good questions for Laura. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then we don't have a, a screen for it up yet, but we're actually going to do an event in uh, in April about uh, how to promote your, uh, your publication after it's already been, after it gets out there. How do you make sure that it really makes an impact on the world, which I think is really, really important. Um, 
So, so keep stay tuned for that. Um, aside from that, uh, if you do want to follow up with myself or uh, with Christy uh, with any more personal or individual questions, or if you just if we don't have a chance to cover your question today, um, you you know have our information uh, in front of you right here um, that you can jot down our emails or take a look at our websites uh, for further information about anything that we really discussed today. So please do um, feel free to uh, to reach out. In fact, you know I. I I, I um, you know, it, it, it always amazes me when people who are as busy as Christy are willing to let people, you know, have their contact information. I think that's a change also, you know, I think it used to be you go onto publishers' websites and it's like finding, uh, you know, uh, finding a, an email of a real human being was like, I don't know, finding the treasure in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, whereas now it's really kind of just an understanding that, that that we need to be more human and more personable and that's that's really important so anyway um don't don't hesitate to reach out um we probably work both too many hours um so uh, yeah. yeah sorry go ahead christine did you want to add something no, I just, I'm, I'm so glad you made that point, Avi, about, I mean, one of the things I think we've really tried to do is there's no reason for publishing to come across as this sort of gatekeeping or black box that it has had for so long. And I think you'll notice if you ask up, ask is, is one way of making sure that we're kind of putting more understanding in the world. The transparency is so key to inclusion. And so I do, you'll notice more and more university presses also have like PUP, you can sign up for an informational interview directly through our website. We want to share what we do. We know the partnerships with all of you are, are what enable us to thrive. And so I think we're just, you know, we're trying to make sure that that is coming across clearly and loudly now. Um, and I do think that's, that's a real shift from what I have seen um, from the earlier years of university press publishing. Yeah. All right, so I wanna to get to a few of the questions here. Bettina asks about, um, I, I guess, you know, we're gonna ask you to be a prophet here for a minute. And, and do you see, uh, you know, conferences sort of retaking their uh, role as the main arbiter of, of not only of sharing information with each other, but also connections with publishers? Or do you think that we're already in a post-conference world? Yeah, I was really glad to see Bettina raise that because I do think I've, I've noticed some universities really stressing the in-person and I can't tell if that's part just sort of a wish to kind of catch up after these two years of suspended collective effervescence and Avi and Alana and I were talking about that even before we got online, there is something really compelling about the in-person, but something so much more inclusive about the Zoom conference and, and look at today where everybody is, is participating from. So I know in the, in the opportunities that I have and that we have had as a publisher, we're lob lobbying to continue some form of Zoom accessibility. Um, and I I'm hoping that conferences will basically take up a hybrid mindset yeah. uh, so that you can still offer reasonable registration. I mean, the costs of attending conferences are significant mm. uh, for everyone. And so I, I really do hope that there will be this way of participating and not being at the periphery of participation, right? Be, being able to participate, to have the conversations um, and, and to also then for those who want to gather and are able to gather, because it's certainly not just a want, it's an ability, um, to, to have that too, or maybe think about ways you separate them. We're trying to think about that even as a, as a, as a press, how do you respect what we've decided is going to be a staff choice hybrid. So anybody can decide how and where, mm -hmm. when they want to work to those who do really thrive on the in-person interaction. So it just, it's, um, it again has to be purposeful. We're not, this is not just going to happen in an organic way. I think it has to be purposeful and I think it has to forebrain equity and inclusion as part of it and not just what sort of, I think the return to normal is where we, any any sense of normalcy and a return I think is is a risk and an unfortunate way of thinking after coming through such a tragic mm -hmm. global experiment, like let's figure out what we can do to pull yeah. through the best parts of it. I mean, I was really arguing so in favor of the hybrid um, option because obviously it's, you know, it's great to meet people in person and I tried to get a few um, in-person conferences myself. 
Uh, but I've seen the hybrid version done really well. This was actually a one-day uh, conference in the UK on, on political theory. Uh, it can work brilliantly. And if technology isn't that expensive. So I kind of think, what's the excuse? <laughs> No, no, I think it's true. And I think we all should be advocating with the institutions that we're affiliated with, we'll be advocating as on the part of a press who exhibits and displays at these conferences. It does take some build out of sort of high tech features in rooms to be able to have it be yeah. an equally appealing experience for those on Zoom and those in person. But that's, you know, it's a one time expense that opens up whole new worlds and conversations. So again, and very much aligned with the missions of anybody working in the scholarly arena that it's it's hard to argue that that's not central to the mission yeah thank you um uh, Inav asked a question about you know as much as we we you know we hope that the publishers are becoming more open and and and, and keeping in mind towards different scholars do you have any specific tips for scholars who are coming from smaller colleges or universities or maybe you know countries that are underrepresented to kind of um, help themselves um, make an impact and make an impression um, in a way that's positive um, beyond, you know, the formal, let's say, fellowships that that, that maybe they can apply for, um, you know, sort of, you know, best practices uh, for scholars uh, to get to get the attention of their acquisitions editor. Right. I think it actually builds on this this conversation we've just been having about Zoom. There, there are a lot of publishers out giving Zoom talks um, in the world. And I know we're all pressed for time and also in languishing mode for too long. But where you have the ability um, to, to participate in some of those, it's a chance to ask questions and get to know publishers uh, in, in a, um, with, a, with fewer barriers of, of entry. Um, so many acquisitions editors are out giving talks and now all quite openly and publicly available. Um, there's com there are conversations underway. I, I work with the Equity and Inclusion um, Committee on AU Presses and also the a Advocacy Committee and Faculty Outreach Committees. And we're thinking now about having AU Presses host two webinars a year uh, that people could attend to be in direct contact with publishers about publishing. And, and I'll make sure that I share that with Avi as soon as we have it and we put it out into the world once it's organized. But I think that's a great way. It's really about just, it's being in the conversation. Other ways, I mentioned peer review earlier, every university press uh, has, it, to be a member of the university press community, you have to demonstrate peer review. And it is really, as I said, it's, it's in our DNA. Peer review is a great way to get to know acquisitions editors. And if you have expertise in an area and are interested in peer reviewing, very often we think about our peer reviews as the prospective author pool. And so, and 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 for all of the reasons that we've been talking about today, we are also very purposefully expanding our networks of peer reviewers. Those need to be a constantly changing and shifting network because that's also a critical part of how works advance in the consideration process. So if you're interested, just reach out to an acquisitions editor in an area. And um, we are always glad to hear about people who are interested in reviewing. Reviewing is, there is remuneration for reviewing, but it still very much relies on altruism. Uh, and so, and, and has been hard in these times to find readers. So I would think about that as another point of connection. I also think cohorts, think about, um, and again, with the international abilities um, facilitated by sort of Zoom interactions, think about who you're in conversation with scholars the world over. I mean, it, it is, it's very challenging to be an isolated voice anywhere in publishing or in scholarship. So the, the networks that you create, the conversations that you create also help amplify your work in, in ways that are noticeable and material and tangible. So I really encourage, and again, Zoom is a great opportunity to create these conversations and create working groups. Another area that has grown more important, but I say this really cautiously because it, it also is a terrain of a time sink and, um, and cognitive uh, disjuncture and emotional one is social media. There is, there is, you know, author platforms are important. Um, it it does really help to to have to, to just think about your author platform. I suspect Laura will be talking about this with the book proposal um, guidelines session too. Um, but you can think about social media as a way to both listen and possibly participate as well. Uh, within the university press world, there's a hashtag, I'll put it in the chat, that, that many posts in university presses are, public, are tagged with, 
um, read University Press's Read UP, um, or you can follow aupresses.org. Um, there, um, but there are also, if there are particular areas that University Presses are publishing in, I would encourage you to think about if you're on social media, following those individual university presses. We do, we are all trying to build direct communities, direct communities with readers, uh, with listeners for audiobooks. We pay attention to those social media platforms and who we're engaging with and who's engaging with the work that we put out there. Uh, so if if you're willing, again, this, you know, this this is not a, it's not a strong urging. It's a, it's another possible channel. And with all of the caveats I shared at the beginning about what, what social media entails, um, but, but another possible way. Yeah, my, my advice to scholars in this, in this, you know, on this topic is, you know, sometimes there's a feeling of like, I need to be everywhere, and that can be overwhelming, and, and that's a mistake. Um, choose something that fits your personality. If you're a blogger and you like writing out, so tell people about your research, you know, in a blog post that's, that's engaging and short and to the point. If you're a person who, you know, likes updating and, and, and being in real time, so maybe Twitter is a, is a good place for you. You know, you don't need, don't try to be everywhere because there's no way to, there's no way to juggle all of your responsibilities as a, as a scholar as well as be on social, you know, all the social platforms. Um, but if you choose one and you can do it, you know, fairly well, then I, I, I think Christy's definitely right that um, you can definitely get the attention um, of, of, of of your colleagues and peers, which is important, as well as the publishing community, which is also, which is also important. In fact, I know that you know publishers sometimes will turn to a scholar if they see that they're working on something. You know, not just wait to get a submission, but they'll actually turn to a scholar. So anyway, I, we have a lot more to talk about, but we're, I, I'm very aware and, and, and sensitive to people's time, and I appreciate you know the, the time that you've already dedicated today. So um, so we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Christy, thank you so, so much for, for joining us. Uh, there was, you know, if I, if I tried to write up all the helpful tips here, I think it would take me a few weeks, um, you know, but I, I hope that, that, that there was, um, you know, that, that everyone was able to take what's relevant to them. Um, and, um, and I really, I, 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 you know, just admire the fact that you, you've, you've developed a mission which really goes well beyond, you know, sort of what we typically are familiar with, with, you know, bottom line or how many books or, you know, just looking at things in, numbers and really um, I'm trying to, to be mission-based and I really um, respect you and Princeton and, and all of the publishers that are working in this direction. So keep up the good work and um, and thank you for joining us and thank you to everyone who, who, who took the time. Again, we'll be sending out the recording in the next few days. So um, you're welcome to go back and, and re-listen to parts that you may not have, uh, that you want to hear again. Really appreciate all of you and Avi, just great learning experience for me as well, which is, is always cherished. Fantastic. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, everyone.